Good morning. So um, I just have to say it's really fun to be back with um, all of you here in Maple Grove. I think I, Don had me here right after I became commissioner. And uh, so for some of you, some of this might be a refresher, although some of the numbers have changed and some of the information has changed. But um, I would just like to say, uh, as he just said, I served uh, 27 years here as a police officer in Maple Grove, 10 years as the police chief. and. Every day as I drive to work, I used to have 2.9 miles to work, and now it's 35 miles doorstep to the doorstep, and that can be anywhere from 35 minutes to three hours, depending on the weather. And, and every day I think, oh man, what was I thinking? <laughs> um, but in reality, uh, my years here in Maple Grove and my, my short times in Glencoe and Marshall, where I served as a police officer, were very rewarding years, and certainly also every day. I miss the people in, in Maple Grove working with all of you. I miss the uh, members of the police department, sworn and civilian. Um, and I loved the role that I got to play as, uh, as chief here in town. And I miss that, but I also have to say that it was time for somebody else to be able to have the opportunity to serve. Uh, Dave just served as chief for three years. Um, we grew up together here in the police department. My husband and Dave went to school together, so we had known each other for a long time. And I knew um, one of my obligations that I, and one of my commitments to the mayor and the council when I took over as chief was to help develop talent so that um, when I left at some point in time, um, there would be somebody here that could take over the role and, and that happened. And then Dave decided to retire and um, they, all, they hired a new chief, Eric Werner, who also is a dear friend of mine. We, went to, we were at the um, University of St. Thomas in the master's program together. And so, I can tell you that you are in very good hands here in Maple Grove and it makes me proud when I drive by the police department or see the squad cars um, traveling around. But um, as, as was mentioned, I was appointed uh, Commissioner of Public Safety, a goal that I had never dreamed of, never even thought of. Um, I'm the 13th commissioner to serve in this, this capacity for the state. Um, I, I like to say my first interview actually for the job was here sitting um, with Adam Prock in constituent outreach for the governor's transition team. I didn't even know it was an interview. They were asking me what I, or Adam was asking me what I thought would be good traits and characteristics and things that um, the governor should consider when he was considering appointing a commissioner. So I came with a big sheet of paper with all my notes and I shared exactly what I thought that should be and I went home and I told Ward, it was a really interesting meeting. I said they were really interested in what, you know, what I had to say and, and Ward's like, well, I think that was an interview. And I'm like, no, that wasn't an interview. <laughs> well, it turned out that was the first of many interviews and, and ultimately the governor did ask me to serve in this capacity and I feel very privileged and very honored to, um, <laughs> I always tried to hide from Dave Kaiser when I was the chief. I'm not a camera person, but he got me this morning. Um, but I'm very privileged and honored to serve in this capacity. And so I'm gonna quickly go over um, a little bit, Actually, how I ended up getting here today is I was out walking my dog around Rice Lake um, back in the fall, and Joe Yard was walking the trail, and I recognized him, and he was walking with his dog, and we started you know, comparing dogs and, and stories and things like that, and he didn't remember me. I remembered him, and he said, well, would you come to Rotary sometime? And I said, I'd absolutely love to. So that's how I ended up here today. But I'm gonna give you an overview of the Department of Public Safety. Um, what I can tell you is we are a very, very large, very complex, very diverse agency, and so um, it's overwhelming when I give this presentation because if I think about it too much, I scare myself silly because it's so much uh, responsibility, but I have, the, the very, very good thing is I have outstanding, I inherited outstanding state employees, about 2,000 strong, um, that work at the Department of Public Safety. So our, our over mis overall mission, as you know, the core function of government is public safety. And so our overall mission at the Department of Public Safety is prevention, preparedness, response, recovery, education, and enforcement across 10 divisions um, at the state. I think, oh, there they do come up. Um, so these are all of the divisions that I'm responsible for at the Department of Public Safety. The Alcohol and Gambling Division, Fire Marshal, the State Fire Marshal's Office, and the, um, also housed in that division is the Office of Pipeline Safety. The Bureau of Criminal App Apprehension, or the BC, uh, typically referred to as the BCA. Our Emergency Communications Networks division, division, which is all of our 911 and armor across the state, so all public safety professionals can talk on one, one channel, essentially, and can talk to each other. Homeland Security and Emergency Management. 
Uh, the Minnesota State Patrol, you probably saw them on TV yesterday or on the news um, last night and this morning regarding the protests that happened in St. Paul. That's a large division, the largest division actually at the Department of Public Safety. Um, driver and Vehicle Services, so I am responsible for that division and all the deputy registrars around the state who um, work to make sure that you get your driver's licenses and registrations and everything that goes along with that. Um, the Office of Traffic Sta Safety, the Office of Justice Programs, um, uh, the Office of Justice Programs actually, we, that is a pass-through grant division, so we, are, we work with um, partners across the state to, um, to administer grants, about $50 million in grants every year that we administer to different um, domestic violence shelters, um, prevention programs, youth prevention programs, and, and the like. Um, the Office of Technology and Support Services, Human Resources, and then our fiscal, um, our fiscal division. So I'm going to go through each one of the um, divisions real quickly. I have until 7.55, is that about right? Okay, sounds good. So just give me the high five if I, that'd be great. I'll give you a minute. That sounds good. So I'll just, just so you can just get an idea of what each of the divisions does. And I probably won't read all of them. You can read, I, I know that you all can read. And so, but I'll highlight a few of them. So the, our alcohol and gambling division is only 19 employees strong. We've got about... Um, or eight of those employees are sworn police officers, and the division director, Michelle Tuckner, actually by statute has to be a sworn police officer as well. When I went to the state, I had the opportunity to either keep the division directors that were in place when I um, got there, or, I would, or some were ready to retire, and, um, or else I could just appoint new ones. And Michelle Tuckner was the lieutenant colonel in the state patrol when I arrived, and she was thinking about retirement. And I um, needed some, a good qualified person to learn the nuances of alcohol and gambling laws. And so I appointed her as the division director for, um, for this division. But they issue all the alcohol licenses and permits. They work with all of our communities. Um, we, they conduct inspections and compliance visits in the area. We conduct gaming investigations at all of the casinos. We monitor the compliance of the 18 tribal casinos. And we conduct background checks on the gaming industry uh, for job applicants for all of the casinos throughout the state. And then we enforce um, and work with local communities to enforce the underage drinking laws. In 2014, um, responsible, they, that division was responsible for about 28,000 alcohol and license permits. They generated about $3 million in revenue. Uh, investigated 1,402 alcohol-related complaints and completed um, just about 250 um, gaming, gambling-related cases. The Bureau of Criminal Hap Apprehension. As you, as you watch through these slides or listen through these slides, you'll see that the Department of P Public Safety really is a service-oriented agency. Um, all, most, almost everything that we do is a service or an assist to local agencies and uh, counties across the state. But the BCA provides services to prevent and solve crimes in partnership with our local law enforcement. So if you th were reading over the weekend about the Apple Valley, um, what appears to be a murder-suicide case, our agents, our BCA agents, are assisting the Apple, police, Apple Valley Police Department on that investigation. And um, I would say, I can't remember the exact, we'll probably get to the numbers, but almost every day or every night I get a briefing um, comes across my email system uh, that our agents are en route to another case, and so they are extremely busy. Um, every homicide case that they assist on, the average number of hours can be up to 2,000 um, hours on an average homicide investigation, when you think about from start to finish. How many agents are there? We have about 55, who asked the question? About 50, 55 agents, um, and we are down uh, about 10 years. Ten years, eight years ago, there were about 73 agents, but we operate in a budget that um, the legislature appropriates money to our division, and so as costs come up, if they don't appropriate more funds to the, to the um, division, we have to operate within that budget. So we have lost um, about 20 agents over the last 10 years. So when you, if you think about covering the entire state, we've got um, field offices across the state where our agents are assigned out of, and we have the main... Um, BCA office in St. Paul, and then we've got a satellite office in Bemidji as well. Are yep. any of those undercover? Well, actually, all of our BCA agents are undercover, if you will, in that they wear plain clothes. So the BCA um, 
officers do not have uniforms other than maybe some logos on their um, polo shirts and things like that. But technically speaking, they're all undercover. So you can see some of the work that we do at the BCA. In 2014, so we've got three main divisions at the BCA. We've got our sworn agents who do the assist to the local, ag local agencies. We have the lab, the forensic laboratory, and we have our training division. And so you can see we completed about 20,000 evidence exams. Um, our International uh, Crimes Against Children unit investigated over 1,000 cases. This is all the internet crimes involving kids. Um, we responded to 91 crime scenes, so that is the, the assist to the local agencies. 289 training courses for almost 7,500 law enforcement officers across the state. Um, this is an interesting number, 152,000 fingerprints that we analyzed for local law enforcement. Um, five, almost 570 criminal history background checks and um, processed 450,000 charging doc documents through e-charging. The question is, do we have to be invited in or do, can we go in because we think we need to go in? And the answer is, we wait for the invitation and we, have, we work with our partners so closely across the state on a, just on a daily basis in so many areas that one of the critical pieces to the work that we do is, is solid partnerships. And so I'm around the state a lot, our superintendent is around the state a lot, building those relationships so there isn't any turf wars when it really comes down to it. And the, the, the real, the real um, situation for most local law enforcement agencies, if you think about small towns in greater Minnesota, they just simply don't have the resources to conduct these investigations. And so they know and we know that they actually really need our help when it comes to these major investigations. Yes? How many uh, employees at your uh, division have analyzed all these cases? I was hoping I wouldn't get stumped on any question. <laughs> I don't know, but I can get back to you on that. Uh, and um, certainly most of the employees that are housed in one of the buildings are at the St. Paul um, building, but, it, but we, have, um, we have field offices across the state and so most of our employees don't work inside of a building, don't report to a building office every day. They might report there to do their work at times, but they also are, are just on the road a lot most of the time. I'll get back to you on that though because I don't know the answer. Our driver, yes? Is Metro Mobility part of your activity? Metro Mobility is not, no. Nope. Driver and Vehicle Services is um, one of our larger divisions, about 550 uh, employees. This is the state agency that has the most contact with people. Uh, we, we are a fees-based um, operation and so we operate on the fees that we collect so 1.4 billion dollars in state revenue in 2014 um, we do the driver's licensing testing and issuance vehicle registration and titles commercial vehicle registration um, we maintain all driving records for every single person in the state of Minnesota who has a driver's license um, crash data and then we do auto dealer licensing and reg regulation as well DVS, um, pub, we have a public information center, or PIC is what we call it. We handle about 1.1 million calls each year, which is why we say we touch the most people um, of any state agency. Um, we conduct, conducted about, uh, um, or actually this is on average, about 573 driver's license tests, uh, 36,000 in non-English languages. We are um, constantly trying to evaluate how many examiners we need. It seems like we just can't quite keep up. And if you have a 16-year-old or if you've had a 16-year-old recently, they've probably had to wait for a long time to get their driver, to get their um, behind, not the behind the wheel, but the actual driving test because there are so many people. And it's really hard to, um, it's really hard to know how many it's going to be and to keep up with those numbers. Oh, yes? On the non-English, do they have to? Yes, they do have to, they do have to be able to do that. Yes. Yes. Could you recommend to our legislators to increase taxes on the licensure? To increase no, I mean our former oh. governor in his infinite wisdom uh, reduced the taxes on licensure licensing for uh, trailers and stuff like that. That's ridiculous to have a, a one time license. Just 
state is missing out on a lot of revenue. But now the DNR wants to make a three-year thing for invasive species on trailers. Yeah, and I understand we're all going to be taking tests if we have a yeah. if we have a trailer. Um, so what do I? Can I recommend to the legislature that is certainly something that I can take back. I really encourage you when you have things like that to talk to your local legislator, Senator Limmer, um, Joint Representative Pepin. Talk to those folks to um, to <laughs> to. The good thing about my job is, uh, although a lot of my work is at the Capitol, especially during session. Um, I always tell people, I never was a politician, I don't want to be a politician, and public safety is for everybody, so I have a really good job as compared to some of the other jobs who are really um, politically impacted a little bit differently than I am. But I can certainly take that back because that is part of my job to advise the governor um, on things that I hear as I'm, I'm out and about, so I can take that back. Um, and so then I won't go through all the rest of them because you've probably had time to read it, but that is what our Driver and Vehicle Services Division does. Our Mus em Emergency Communications Networks Division, I, had, I didn't have an idea that I would be working on this when I came to the state of Minnesota, but we deliver comprehensive emergency communications networks, which is the state 911 program. So all of the police officers and firefighters and emergency um, services personnel around this area and across the state um, use the 911 program and the armor system that allows the connections of the communications across the state. And it allows us to go to another jurisdiction and for officers and, um, I'm sorry, public safety professionals to continue to be able to talk on the same channel so that there isn't a need for two or three different radios. Like when I started in 1984, we, we could go to Plymouth, but we couldn't necessarily talk to the officers in Plymouth when we were assisting them. So we've come a long way. But we provide technical assistance to cities and counties to implement, maintain, and improve the 911 system. And we partner with 100, uh, over 100 public safety answering points or dispatch centers. So the new dispatch center that uh, Hennepin County built, we are a partner with them in providing technical assistance and, and some funding. The funds, um, the PSAP improvements, and we share radio, the, share the radio systems. In 2014, 96% of the armor backbone is on the air. So we're almost 100% built out across the state of Minnesota. The migration, we completed the migration to the 911 emergency service IP network. Some of this is a little bit more technical than I need for this. but. Um, and then we continue again um, to work with all of our partners across the state to make sure that the systems are working. Our Homeland Security and Emergency Management Program or Division, um, when I was the chief here for the first five years, I actually was a certi or I actually am a certified emergency manager. But the role of chief here, um, I also served as the city's emergency management director. And then about halfway through my term, um, we, uh, Fire Chief Anderson and I worked with the city council. And we determined that the fit was better to be in the fire department. So the current emergency management director is the fire chief here in town. But we help, the, the role of, um, that divi of this division is to help Minnesotans prevent, prepare, respond, and recover from natural and man-made disasters. And that's pretty self-explanatory. In 2014, we managed state response to two disasters. In, um, floods and tornado, tornadoes, we had nine federally declared disasters, disasters since 2010. So I have been working a lot with the governor on these disasters across the state. Um, we awarded 196 grants to local governments and 63, totaling $63 million in federal funds. And I'm getting the four minutes left, so I'm not going to read all of these. Yes, How question? Are faced with the people out at the airport, you know, the, that division that, you know, secures us walking in and out of the airport. Do you have any interaction with that, or is that all federal? That's TSA, and so that is federal. Now, we do work very closely with the emergency management director, um, Christy Rollwagen, at the airport. Um, one of our roles during the Ebola scare, which is still, is still ongoing, our work with them, we... Um, Every, more, every Monday morning at 8.30, they host a conference call among all public <laughs> safety professionals involved in that um, potential if, if a patient was to come through the airport. And so we work very closely with the emergency management out there, but not TSA. Who makes the decision on when protesters walk down Highway 35 in Lincoln City, when to allow someone the right to freedom of speech versus the rights of others to get back and forth to work? Um, those are an easy call, really. 
how is that decision made? Um, very carefully. Yes, it does. <laughs> it does. Uh, actually, um, the day that the 35W incident, um, and actually, ultimately, the governor is responsible for the state for me, or, you know, I work for the governor, the governor's, uh, the state patrol is the governor's, the freeways are the governor's responsibility because it is statewide jurisdiction. And so the day of the 35W incident, what would happen there is, um, it was the Take Action Minnesota was protesting at Burger King, I think, or McDonald's, one of the two. And then they joined forces with Black Lives Matter and they decided to go onto the freeway. And the really the honest answer is we weren't prepared for them to go on the freeway. And so we made a conscious decision that the safest way to deal with the situation was to facilitate their movement on the freeway to the next exit, because we knew they were headed, intelligence told us they were headed towards City Hall. So that's what we did. On that same day, and, and it is working myself and the Colonel of the State Patrol making the decision and his command staff, but that on that day we also made a conscious decision that in the interest of public safety and the pu when I say public safety um, I mean the safety of the protesters and the safety of the motoring public um, balanced with the right of people to be able to protest like they were doing we balanced that in our mind but we'd made a conscious decision that we were not going to allow the freeway to get shut down again so if you watched yesterday our preparation all last week, and we were in several meetings. I was in, a, in meetings with the, um, the State Patrol Command staff. They were in meetings with St. Paul PD, with Metro Transit PD, and with Ramsey County Sheriff's Office, planning for yesterday's event. And then I met with my staff, met with the governor, and then we all met with the governor on Saturday afternoon um, to protect the freeway and to it, in the interest of public safety. And so as you watch that, our jurisdiction is the freeway. The Minnesota State Patrol's jurisdiction is the freeway. And with the support of the other agencies, we, we did just that. We didn't allow it to be shut down. One of the things that happened yesterday is we found out that they had um, motorists. They had people in cars, and they attempted to shut the freeway down themselves. And we were able to convince them to open the freeway back up and keep moving. Yes? As, 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 uh, as a state, do we have any... Uh, Well, you know, that's a tough question because there was no prom property damage and there were no injuries. There was, and so um, it is our responsibility, public safety is our responsibility. And so the good news is it, our, our efforts worked yesterday. The protest were, protesters were able to protest. St. Paul made a conscious decision that they were going to allow and help facilitate their movement on city streets, which is what happened. And we were going to protect the freeway because of public safety interests and so everybody's interests were met. Um, I don't think we've seen the last of the protesting and so we're going to have to continue to, to work that plan to make sure that everybody's interests are met to the best of our abilities. So it's a, um, to go back to your question, it is a balance act and it's a, um, I actually I appointed a new colonel to the state patrol last Tuesday um, and he is, getting, he is getting his experience in the first five days of his job. We talked last night after things had calmed down and he said, boy, I loved being, the, he was the lieutenant colonel, and he said, I loved being number two, but this being number one is a whole different story. <laughs> I said, you know, I just, I had the same conversation with Dave Jess after he was appointed chief here. He loved being number two when somebody else could make the decisions and he could support them. Um, he did a great job, but the number one job is a hard job and, and you have to ba balance the interest of everybody. So, yes. I'm very familiar with the department. The last job, I used to work in the state of Minnesota more than 30 years ago. My last job was auditing that department, <laughs> and that was part of my decision to get the hell out. <laughs> <laughs> that is a massive, massive organization. How did you walk into that and get your arms around? I mean, it took you better for a year to audit that thing. Um, how did you get your arms around this thing? Well, I think that's a really good question, and that's a, that is a reality. I'm going to just kind of whip through these slides as I'm talking because I'm not going to be able to. Do you have three minutes? Let's, yeah, let's, let's answer, I'll answer questions. And what I can do is I, if anybody's interested in this PowerPoint presentation, I'd be happy to share it with you. If you can give it to Joel, then I can put it up, I'll link on our website. 
we'll do that. So the question was, how did I wrap my arms around um, this job? First of all, one of the good things when I went to the state of Minnesota was I knew nothing. I shouldn't say I didn't know, I knew nothing. I didn't know how the Department of Public Safety operated, and so I had to rely on the good people that work there to help me through it. I w I, um, after the election, the governor has to ask commissioners to come back or not, so he didn't have to keep us if he chose a diff wanted to choose a different management team, essentially. And the, I met with the chief of staff, and she asked if I would stay on for four more years. So I have committed to four more years um, in this job. But as I was having the conversation with her, I said, you know, I feel cheated sort of out of the first two or three years on this job because there's so much work to be done. But it took me two years to actually feel like I had an idea of what I was talking about when I would come out to groups like this. I think back and I look back at pictures and I was working 16 and 17 hour days because I was either working or studying my new job. So I feel like I got a new, another master's degree <laughs> sometime in that first two years because I I, I mean, I even had to learn differently how a bill passes through the legislature. You know, we all think we kind of know because we kind of follow it, but when you are actually responsible to push the governor's budget, to push policy initiatives that we've worked with the governor and the governor's staff on, our success is, is if we take 10 initiatives to the Capitol at the beginning of session, our success is coming out with 10 good outcomes. And so just learning that work, um, I think, you know, being the chief sort of taught me you have to rely on good people to do your work that you, one person can't do it all. We know that. We're all better if we have a good team um, that we trust and that we can work together. And I pulled a team together that I felt I could, um, that I could trust and they could trust me. And I relied on that. Um, I still, though, one of the fascinating things about this work is I learned something every single day, something different about the agency that I didn't know. And so it will be that way, I think, for four years. But I think that the next four years, starting now, will be not, not more, less intense because we've got a lot of work to do, but I will worry less about the things that I don't need to worry about. I worried about everything the first four years. Now I've been able to check some of that stuff off my list because I have either other people worrying about it for me or I've just learned it. 